New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. Who were the young American pilots that strapped themselves into fighter jets, launched up, up and away into the wild blue yonder, and aimed to pry tiny Kuwait from Saddam Hussein's fist? We'll travel back to the first Gulf War next. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Ground forces are not engaged. This conflict started August 2nd when the dictator of Iraq invaded a small and helpless neighbor. Kuwait, a member of the Arab League and a member of the United Nations, was crushed. Its people brutalized. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. And a special tip of the hat to everybody watching today's time travel adventure via our YouTube and Rumble channels. You can find me at historyauthor.com. All my social media is linked there. Plus, you can read my columns in the Washington Times to get my analysis of current events through the light of the history I've learned from all these books behind me, but also from guests like today's. Our time machine this week welcomes aboard Mike Guardia. He's an acclaimed military historian, and he's a U.S. Army veteran. He brings us Skybreak, the 58th Fighter Squadron in Desert Storm. Mike Guardia served six years on active duty as an armor officer, and he's widely praised for his acclaimed bio, Hal Moore, A Soldier Once and Always. That book chronicles the real life of Lieutenant General Harold G. Moore, whose leadership you may recall being portrayed by Mel Gibson in the film We Were Soldiers, about the Vietnam War. Mike has been nominated for the Army Historical Foundation's Distinguished Book Award. Not once, but twice. That's the kind of award you really have to earn, right? They're not just throwing those things around. In 2021, he was named Author of the Year by the Military Writer Society of America. You can visit our guest, get to know him a little bit more at MikeGuardia.com or on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Okay, now that we've arrived back in the desert, on January 17th, 1991, Let's strap ourselves in as the air war begins and we join the 58th Fighter Squadron for Skybreak. And here we are with Mike Guardia. He's joining us to chat about his book, Skybreak, the 58th Fighter Squadron in Desert Storm. Thank you so much, first for your service and for joining me today on the History Author Show. Well, thank you, Dean. It is a pleasure to be here. Well, I wanted to do this book because it's a bit of history that I lived through. I was in uh -huh. college during the first Gulf War, and so was paying attention. Was I was already a news junkie. I was already somebody who read a lot of magazines and newspapers of all different sorts. So this was the first war that we had constant coverage because we had CNN and things like that. And so for me, I like getting this book because... I get a million about the Civil War, the Second World War, even the Great War. We just had the Centennial and the Gulf War somehow gets lost. And that's in part, I'd argue, because of the outstanding performance of these pilots in Skybreak. It's not very dramatic because they made it look easy. And people said, well, there, there's no story to be told there, which is laughable because now I've read Skybreak. So I know that there was a story to be told. What inspired you to tell that story when People do like to focus sometimes on those big set piece wars. Right. Well, I think Desert Storm was really a watershed event in American history. And I think it's a shame that it really doesn't get more coverage. It was the last high intensity conflict that we had. And it was one of the last dogfighting air wars that we had. And I think in a lot of ways, it underscored the remarkable transformation that our military had undergone in the immediate era of the post-Vietnam malaise. And I think really when you take it all together, it just shows, you know, it shows one, how far we came from Vietnam 
And it is, it's also an incredible testament to the bravery and the, uh, and the outstanding airmanship of our pilots. Everything was negative. It was going to be a disaster. It was going to be Saddam's army was too tough. These gut pilots had just fought an eight year war with Iran. That's only a couple dozen months before here. The air war starts. Our planes wouldn't be good enough. Our, our tanks wouldn't work in the desert. There was so much negative that was going on. And I, I know this. I'm working in news myself. It's one reason I didn't want to work in cable news anymore. Ultimately, as much as we talk about the technology, it's the men in those seats and they were all men. So how did they line up as people? Because they're the ones who ultimately have to make the decisions. You can have the greatest plane right. you want, but as we just relearned in Afghanistan and had learned in Vietnam, technology is not going to get you past a bad plan or a bad outlook or bad leadership. Absolutely. And there is absolutely no question in my mind that our pilots had superior airmanship skills and really pound for pound, they were the best fighter pilots in the sky. You know, if you just take a look at the comparative training programs, it is abundantly clear to anyone who sees all of the training aspects that, that our pilots went through, that they actually trained how they fought. And I think one of the biggest qualitative differences in our training program versus the Iraqi training program is that our pilots were trained with a very heavy emphasis on independent thought and also being allowed to take the initiative whenever they're in the sky because it's that pilot who was in that dogfight at that particular minute who was the best qualified to make the decision on how he should direct his own plane and also how he should direct his own formation. I wanted to ask you about that because their nickname is the Gorillas, and mm -hmm. you can see that in their patch that they have right gorillas always look cool when you stylize and draw them and right. tough animal strong animal but the name is from gorilla warfare and from the tactics that their antecedents had deployed in the mediterranean theater of the second world war against the axis powers since you just brought that up about these guys are the best ones at that time in that cockpit to make the decision were there any of those opportunities there where something came up that they didn't expect and they were able to apply tactics that those fellas way back in the Second World War, those pilots would have been able to nod and say, yeah, well done. That, that's keeping the guerrilla spirit alive. Oh, yeah. So they actually found themselves in a pretty interesting situation, I think, because by the second or third, I, I, I actually think it was by the third week of the air war, most of the Iraqi Air Force by that time had been destroyed. They, 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 they had either been blown out of the sky, they had been, uh, a lot of them had been destroyed on the ground. And if any of them did survive, they were constantly fleeing across the border into Iran. So you had by about the 5th of February, where all of the air to air missions were getting a lot fewer and farther in between. And they found themselves in a situation where they were saying, okay, well, there are only so many Iraqi planes left and we're really just burning holes in the sky doing these racetrack patterns. We want to feel like we are gainfully employed. So how are we going to do that? Well, if I'm a pilot and I am inside the cockpit of an F-15C, I know that the mount that I'm taking is really optimized for air-to-air -air operations. Yeah, the plane that I'm flying isn't really suited for, uh, it isn't really suited for attack missions. So, is there any way that I could adapt this plane that I'm flying to engage ground targets? And, and that's when the wheels start spinning and they say, okay, well, the F-15C was designed with the mantra, not one pound for air to ground. So is there something that we can do to manipulate the weapons we have to engage ground targets? And that was when one of the pilots said, hey, you know what? I remember something that I learned in, in the last squadron that I was stationed at where you could manipulate the gun reticle to optimize it to engage targets on the ground. You can, you can actually do strafing runs. And what ended up happening was they, uh, they said, okay, well, if we can depress it to a, a certain number of mils, and we can also depress it to a certain number of degrees, we can probably take out an entire Iraqi column, you know, and we can make life that much more difficult for any of the ground forces who try to engage coalition forces by the time the ground war starts. And the only thing was is that when they tried to do this, 
none of them had ever practiced any type of strafing missions before. I mean, all they had trained on were air-to-air -air operations. Uh, so the uh, so the first strafing runs that they tried to do, really, for lack of a better term, they all ended up they uh, they all all ended up becoming a comedy of errors. You know, they would try to uh, they would try to do these low flying passes over these Iraqi ground convoys, and you know the bullets would vector off to the left, or they would vector off to the right, and it actually had an incredible shock effect on the Iraqi ground troops because they had no idea from which direction the next set of bullets would be coming from. So they were scattering all over the landscape, and in, in a lot of places, in, in, in a, a lot of places, they were actually abandoning their equipment and, and uh, you know just trying to uh, just trying to hold on for dear life. But after about three or four iterations of this, they finally got the strafing runs down to where they could actually, they could actually focus aim the bullets and uh, take out a column or take out a, uh, take out a concentration of troops within one pass. But it was not without its growing pains because you had the squadron leadership say, hey, I don't want you to strafe any ground targets because all we're supposed to do is shoot down enemy planes. We are strictly an air superiority unit. So nobody is going to do any strafing missions unless they are cleared by the AWACS to do it. And it was unfortunate because right after the first one or two strafing missions, two of the best pilots in the squadron got grounded because the uh, because the wing commander was angry at him. <laughs> Telling you uh, not to do what you came there to do. That's tough. Right. But I guess you have to have discipline, right? I guess. So, yeah. But again, as you said, hey, we're not up here just flying around. And when you think just in a monetary idea or perspective right. that, hey, it costs to keep those up there. And also... <laughs> yes. These guys had been learning tactics, it's interesting to me, to fight the Soviets. That was our planned adversary, right, for the right. last 50 years. Here we have ground targets in the desert. They're not fighting in Warsaw. We're not fighting in the forests of Europe. And there's not infinite planes up here. So I, right. I like that idea. And I, I like that in Skybreak. You get to know these guys and you see that they're exactly what we on the ground would expect our pilots to be, want them to be. We want them to have a little of that top gun bravado in them. I wanted to ask you how they got chosen because this is a 34 nation coalition that President George H.W. Bush compiles under the UN resolution. There are a lot of people out there, but obviously the US is the ones that are going to be doing the heavy lifting because we, we have the biggest fist, we have the biggest arsenal out there and the best mm -hmm. training as you were just saying. So we end up doing that heavy lifting and somebody has to switch from Desert Shield, which is purely defensive, what you were just talking about. These pilots were just there to fly circles in the air, make sure that Saddam didn't push his advantage into Saudi Arabia to Desert Storm. So somebody has to be, mm -hmm. as you call it in Skybreak, the tip of the spear, and it turns out to be the 58th Fighter Squadron. So why are they chosen for that job? What made them the ones that fit on paper the mission that they needed to be done? That's because pound for pound, the F-15C fighter was really the best fighter jet that we had in the U.S. arsenal. When you take a look at all, all of its metrics performance on paper, in the fall of 1990, we had no other fighter jet that could fly as far, that could also stay aloft as long, and could also shoot as far as the latest model F-15C could. But pound for pound, this really was the best jet that we had. And in, in terms of its EW capabilities and also in terms of its SA capabilities, this really was an example of us putting our best foot forward to try and achieve that shock effect and try and achieve uh, air superiority within, you know, within the first few weeks of the air campaign. I wanted to ask you about that, the way these planes, the F-15Cs and then the Soviet-made MiG-29 Fulcrums, both mm -hmm. for both how they matched up because... This was another thing I remember hearing our planes could not stand up to the Soviets. Soviets had just been fighting in Afghanistan as well. It was all this negative drumbeat, but also not just negativity and the things that I put down people in news, but there was understandable anxiety because people had just lived through the Vietnam War. It was certainly in living memory from 20 years before or less than 20. So I don't want to bash people too much, my fellow Americans on that, how we felt, but there was legitimate worry. How did they match up and would those MiGs have, have had a chance? Well, you have to remember that not all F-15s are created equal. Uh, the earlier model F-15s were likely in inferior to the MiG-29, but there's no question that the F-15C really stood 
head and shoulders above the MiG-29, and that was in terms of both its EW and its SA capabilities. Yeah, um, you really had an overmatch that was playing out in the skies over Iraq, and I think it's a bit humorously ironic how hindsight seems to change people's points of view. You know how we went into the conflict saying that, oh gosh, you know the F-15C, it's untested in combat. Yeah, the Israelis had a good run of the F-15 in their air wars over Syria, but you know this is a different enemy. You know this is a different dynamic. And you know there was a big question mark drawn, and even some of the uh, even some of the talking head analysis and defense experts were saying, "Gosh, I really don't know how the F-15 is going to stack up against the MiG-29. This is you know supposedly the latest and greatest of the Soviet Air Force, but uh, you know when we see how how uh, how they perform against each other, and then we have the hindsight of analyzing their comparative performance metrics now that all of the Cold War classifications have gone away." You know, it, it's uh, quite interesting to see how people change the narrative and say, oh, yeah, of course, the F-15C was superior to the MiG-29. It always was. And, you know, there was never any question in our mind that it would be a superior airplane. But, uh, you know, when you're talking about a bolt by bolt comparison, uh, yeah, the F-15C stands head and shoulders above the MiG-29. Uh, it can it can see farther. It can shoot farther. And, you know, we have seen that play out time and time again. And uh, even if you look at a, uh, if you look at their their uh, uh, comparative combat histories in a broader sense, you see that uh, the F-15. You know, this includes all models of the F-15. The F-15 has a uh, has a kill loss ratio of more than 100 to zero, whereas you take the MiG-29, its kill loss ratio is more like six to 18. It's something that you say really noteworthy to me that. We look back now and we say, well, of course, it's it's definitely a better plane. But at the time, certainly not known. And even right. you're saying the Soviet Union, and I'm saying to myself, it was the cream of the Soviet Air Force. And immediately in my head, a little voice says, well, yeah, it's kind of like saying Mo is the smartest stooge. Because right. now we think of it's impossible to think of the Soviet Union without seeing it just laying in ruins. But at the time, it was very important and it was very it was very mm -hmm. scary to a lot of people that they thought, well, what's going to happen here? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it, it, uh, it's one of those things where hindsight really makes people change their points of view. And they tend to forget all of the bits and pieces where they didn't have information. And with that lack of information, they, they pretty much created their own reality. Funny how success does that. Everybody, mm -hmm. if there's failure and you look at the second Iraq war, which comes into being occupation, it was the opposite effect almost. Well, no, no, none of us wanted to go in there. We all knew what it was. So success, of course, has many fathers and failure is an orphan. So that's kind of what we see here. And I didn't want these pilots in Skybreak to become orphaned in the sense of history where they didn't have an advocate. And I think it's great that you came and advocated for them and said, I'm going to tell their story because that's a great idea for a book and a, a great mission, really, to give these guys the respect that they, they didn't get. It was my pleasure. And I had a tremendous amount of fun writing this book. I mean, it, it was such an incredible experience for me to be able to, uh, to be able to sit down with these pilots and you know, just be able to get their, their stories down on paper. And, uh, you know, hear what each and every one of their backgrounds were, because I actually think that that's a critical component for any topic of military history, because, you know, whenever, well, you know, whenever these forces go to war, it's really never truly a clinical pursuit. It's always something that has a very distinctive uh, human element behind it. And each one of these pilots, they bring their own unique perspectives to the table. And they, you know, they have their own unique outlooks, they have their own experiences, and each one of them have different ways of recollecting the same event. They can all agree on the facts, but it's the events that led up to and influenced those facts that they carry those different interpretations about. It's something you do at the end of the book. And I, having read many books, of course, and history books, I was impressed. It struck me that page at the end of Skybreak where you list a dozen names of people that you interviewed and not just one-off interviews is the impression that, that I certainly get from it. You go back to these guys. And to me, because I do interviews myself and I used to work on a TV pet show of all things, it's pretty different from this. And because I'd had a veterinary background, when I used to book people, they knew you knew a little bit they would open up to you more as guests in the case of skybreak i feel that gives you a richer book that you're able to produce because you could come to people as an army veteran yourself and 
ask informed questions. How did that help you? How did your background help you make connections with these pilots from the Gulf War so that when somebody picks up Skybreak, they're getting more than they might get just from reading a journalist report and interview in Time Magazine from 30 years ago? Right. Well, if I had to sum it up, I think one of the things that really helps me connect with my subjects is pretty much like you said, I mean, it is the fact that I'm a veteran and, you, you know, that we have that shared experience there. And even though I'm a former army officer and I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around how, uh, around how the Air Force operates, I think, it, I think it's that, I, I really think that it is that brotherhood of being a veteran that is the first and most important step to making those connections. And then also I think how I frame the questions itself and how I actually frame the outline of the book because when I contacted um, each one of these pilots from the 58th, you know, I, uh, I, I always made it a point to, I, I made it a point to tell them what my background was. I said, you know, hey, uh, I'm an army officer and I'm also a recent army officer. And not only that, I have a background as a military historian and being a military historian and an army officer, I want to put a, uh, I want to put an atmosphere within the book that shows what people like us have been through and what people like us have experienced. And to show any members of the book buying public out there that war is never truly a clinical pursuit. It's not something that you could really read as a parochial study. It's something that has a very distinctive human element behind it. And I wanna capture that human element and tell it through the eyes of those who are fighting it in real time and those who are, you know, who are essentially, um, essentially removed from the news media and can say, and can say, okay, here's what we were feeling, here's what we were doing, and here is what we want the American public to know about our experiences and how we contributed to the outcome of this conflict. And when I put it in those terms, I think it was a lot easier for any one of the subject matters to be receptive to what I was doing, and also to uh, you know also to break down I think any any barriers of mistrust that would otherwise have been there. You are enjoying my conversation with Mike Guardia. He's the author of Skybreak, the 58th Fighter Squadron in Desert Storm. You can visit him at mikeguardia.com or find him on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. As I was reading reviews for this book. I came across one from a lady named Victoria. She's the daughter of a Gulf War veteran who passed away during the writing of Skybreak, and I learned mm -hmm. she had a connection to it. She said, quote, I'm beyond honored for the dedication of this inspirational book to my father, Jose Matos. He would be beyond proud of this insightful and well-written book about true heroes. Thank you, Mike Guardia, for telling this story. And most importantly, your friendship with my father in his final days. Mike, I certainly wanted to read that right there because you were just talking about getting these men to open up and this shows you made a connection here. You made a connection with somebody who was in one of those cockpits, who was seeing the elephant as they call it, called it in any way in the Great War. You chose to make that dedication at the front of your book. So when people read that in Skybreak, what do you hope that tells them about the story that they're going to get not just in this book, not just in Skybreak, but in any of your books, that you make connections with your subjects as much as you can. You get to know these guys. What do you hope that tells your readers that this isn't just another book of military history? Well, if anything, I really hope that the readers take away this. I want them to know that each story that is presented, and especially when it's a story that involves conflict, that there is a distinctive human element to it. I want them to know that I am telling something from the perspective of the men who were there to live it and breathe it in real time. More than anything, I really want the readers to know that anytime our forces are sent overseas or anytime that our military is sent in, into harm's way, that uh, the people who are doing the heavy lifting on the ground, whether it's a soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine, that you know that they at the end of the day are people just like you and me you know they have their they have their dreams they have their ambitions they have fears they have their insecurities they you know they are every bit as human as as uh, as you and i and if they can find a connection 
to anything that this person has experienced or anything that this person has said. I really want the reader to be able to make that connection and to tell themselves, well, gosh, you know, this, this paints such an intimate picture of history that you wouldn't necessarily get from a parochial text that says, on, on this particular day, at this particular place, this particular battle happened, and here were all of the casualty outcomes, and here, here are all the metrics, and here's the post-war analysis of how it affects the political discourse of this place or the other. I really want them to be able to see history through the eyes of someone who could very easily be their next door neighbor. You do that very early in Skybreak where you put us in the air on January 15th, 1991, when the defense of Saudi Arabia turns to an offensive mission and mm -hmm. Desert Shield becomes Desert Storm. You put us up there with Captain J.B. Kelk. You go up and you're in a peacekeeping mission and a defensive mission. And by the time that JB Kelk, Captain Kelk lands, he's finding out that, hey, we're switching to offense, guys. Right, exactly. So it 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 actually follows a continuum of feelings. You know, at first, when they first got the word that, okay, this has now shifted from Desert Shield to Desert Storm, and now we have gone from a defensive mindset to an offensive mindset. The first reaction that I think almost every one of those pilots had was, okay, wow, this is real and it's happening. And I am having to, I, I am having to fight off the rush of adrenaline. I'm nervous. I have butterflies in my stomach. It's the big fight that you know that you're going into. And that feeling lasted for, I think, maybe the first hour or two after they knew that it was going to be a shooting war now. But they all commented on one specific phenomenon. They said that they were nervous. And they were even nervous right up through the pre-fright bleeps. But by the time they actually got into the cockpit and by the time they fired up the engine, they said, you know what? It was at that point that all the nerves left and that yeah. it was almost a nonchalance as we were telling ourselves, OK, well, this is what we prepared to do. This is what we trained for. Now we know that we are going to go up into the sky and I'm either going to, I'm either going to land safely on the runway or, you know, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to bail out over Iraq. Either way, I'm going to get to the ground. So whether I do it alive and in one piece with my plane or, you know, I, I, I do it in some other form or fashion, that is going to be the outcome of this event. And I have faith in myself. I have faith in my equipment. You know what? I'm ready let's go do this. And after about the, after about the first few confirmed air to air kills, uh, it had changed from that nonchalance to excitement. It's like, okay, gosh, we've already killed, we've already killed uh, um, so many Iraqi planes. Come on, let's see how more of them we can shoot down. So it always, it was, it was uh, kind of unusual in the sense that it, it, it followed that continuum. It was, it was fear and nerves followed by a nonchalance and an acceptance followed by excitement. Everybody, for some reason, the U.S. forces fight are always called elite. Every enemy force is always built up as, as fearsome. But then they have so much success at doing their job so well when it comes time to move to the land war and actually physically kick Saddam's forces out of Kuwait. People say, well, why don't you just keep doing the air war? That's going so well. Just no acknowledgement in between of, yeah, we were wrong about that. So th this is fascinating in Skybreak to be in moments like that where you say, yeah, you guys, first they tell you you're no good and the other guys are better. Then you're so good that they want you to just keep doing the job. And that's all stuff that's hard to block out of your mind when you're leading, I would assume. And when these guys are just trying to focus on doing a job that they have to be really paying attention up there, right? Oh, they sure do. They sure do, you know, because uh, because everything was happening in real time and they didn't have the same access to information that everyone else had. You know, it, it was uh, I, I think in a lot of ways, it's humorously ironic that uh, people were finding out um, more information about the war through CNN than our own pilots were on the front lines at that time. And, you know, because you had that trickle down effect where, you know, it seems to be that CNN was at the uh, top of the information period. You know, you uh, you had the pilots, even though they knew that they were confirming all of these kills, they really didn't know too much about what was going on throughout the broader context of the war. And you know, it was that it was that information lag that I think helped that I think helped perpetuate some of the uncertainty uh, 
about what was happening inside of the broader context of the war. It's like, okay, well, we know that we're doing well and we know that we're shooting down all these enemy planes, but what is the unit to the left and right of us doing? I mean, are we actually winning the broader war and what's gonna happen with the ground war and, and, uh, you know, and, all, and so on and so forth. I think when uh, the information flow really started to catch up to them was right around the end of February when, when you had the ground war actually kick off. And even though the air campaign had done so well, and you know, even though we had decimated Iraq's air force, you know, there was still a very pronounced doubt about how well our ground forces could stack up, especially against the Republican Guard. I, I know that one of the biggest talking points among all the defense analysts and talking heads on CNN was that we were gonna have 20,000 casualties on the first day of the ground war alone. And that, and that uh, the air missions themselves would be shifting from air superiority to almost exclusively close air support. And there might not be enough close air support assets to go around because of the anticipated heavy fighting that was gonna happen on the ground. Yeah, another group, as I was referring to there dismissively that we were told that the fearsome Republican guard, and then remember the, right. I'm sure you don't remember, but reading from your reading, right, the Saddam Fedayeen, and they just mm -hmm. throw out a bunch of names and then suddenly those guys, and fortunately, not that there weren't casualties on the coalition side, but fortunately, because of that training, because they blocked that a lot of that out, they were able to go in there and, and win and do really well. And for me, I do want to focus on the other side or talk about what the other side is, because it's easy to just dismiss them as cartoon villains that were just made of cardboard and that that American forces just rolled over. And one thing that I read in Skybreak was common to those pilots that were in those biplanes from the very first days of the Great War when we first had planes in the air fighting part of our wars, and that's weather. And mm -hmm. as I'm reading Skybreak, I find this quote you have that a cold front had descended over Saudi Arabia which made me right. sit back a little and chuckle because, of course, I think of Saudi Arabia as being hot, dry, dusty, sandy, and I don't think of it there being a cold front. And so it made me want to ask you, how did the men of the 58th Squadron adapt to those local flying conditions? Because that is something that the pilots on the other side have as an advantage. They've been flying in this region their whole lives. Our pilots have been trained to fight in Western Europe to hold back a Soviet attack. Mm -hmm. And so how did that affect it? How did they stack up to these guys who've been flying there their whole lives? And here these Americans are coming in and they don't have the experience yet in the land. Were there Was there any impact there trying to fight in the desert? Oh, sure. Yeah. So one of the really one of the biggest things that is always going to impact flight operations is the weather. And, you know, one of the things that they told me was that when you go into Saudi Arabia, you would expect it to be hot and dry all the time. You know, maybe you will see half an inch of rainfall throughout the entire year. But what they found out pretty quickly was that was that the weather conditions in Saudi Arabia can really change on a dime. And you really have different climates at, at different parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, where they were stationed in Tabuk, it was a, it was a high desert plateau, um, what you would probably compare to the Sierra Nevada. And they said, you know, it could be cool and it could be dry. But then, of course, on any number of random occasions, you could have a cold front come in. And that could, quite frankly, disrupt uh, your entire flight operations for the day. Flight operations are also impacted by the amount of ambient starlight. It just so happens to be uh, present throughout any nighttime operations. And they say that, uh, you know, all of your air-to-air -air operations will rise and fall as a function of the weather. Because if, if you don't have ideal weather conditions and you don't have good visibility, that's going to impact your mission planning on any particular day. And when the skies are clear, you might only have a small window of operability. Maybe the skies will be clear from 12 noon until 4 p.m. But if you're expecting a if you're expecting a thunderstorm, or more to the point, if you're expecting a sandstorm, well, that's going to impact how you plan your missions there. But one of the things that the 58 Fighter Squadron did incredibly well was being able to adapt to all, all of those all of those changes in the weather, because one of the things that uh, any number of deployed air forces do is they have their own meteorolo uh, they have their own meteorological units and stations that are specifically designed to give reports on the weather and send this information to flight commanders to say okay 
here's the weather forecast for maybe the next five days or the next 10 days, or maybe here's for the next 24 hours. How is this going to impact all of your air taskings and stuff like that? So I think they did an incredible job of being able to work around a lot of the mercurial weather patterns that could descend over Saudi Arabia and even over Iraq proper. We look back now and this seems just to be an opening phase of a larger mm -hmm. war. Of course, like the doughboys that I keep mentioning, I keep going back to the Great War. This uh -huh. doesn't end with a clear cut surrender as we might think on the USS Missouri. There isn't, to mix my wars, go back to the Civil War, there isn't a US Grant style unconditional surrender and you give up everything. To go there, to sacrifice, to win, to do your job and then only set the stage for a bloodier conflict later, which is what happens in both the Great War here and the First and Second Gulf War. How did those pilots come to see their service in those years? You're, you're interviewing them now, so they've had a chance to do what you were talking about a few times here. They have the mm -hmm. benefit of hindsight now too. How do they feel about their service, not just in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, but also then they impose the no-fly zones and ultimately mm -hmm. there's a Second Gulf War. How do they look back on their legacy now, the men in Skybreak? Well, you know, I never asked them too much about what what their feelings were on the more recent conflicts in Iraq and also the no-fly zones. Um, they did give some of their recollections about actually being parts of those missions. Um, but I think in a broader sense, I think a lot of the veteran community has taken the approach that if we were going to do a regime change in Iraq, the time to do it probably would have been 1991. Because you know, when you look at the when when you look at the second Iraq War and you look at the second and third order effects of that conflict, you know, and you you take into account ISIS, you also take into uh, you also take in, into account the Iranian intervention. You know, it's very hard to give it, it's very hard to give a soldier's blessing to how the second Iraq War has played out. And what I found when I was doing an earlier book, Days of Fury. I kind of sort of sense that the skybreak pilots um, feel this way too, is that you know the time to do regime change would have been in the early 90s, simply as a function of the assets that we had available to us at the time. We had more than half a million troops in the desert. We had the backing of the international community. We had the Shiites who were conducting an uprising. And they would have been on our side. We had a Kurdish uprising. They also would have been on our side. So those are two indigenous groups of homegrown allies that we could have had to affect any style of regime change there. And that if we had done it then, then that would have, that, then that would have eliminated the foundations for us going back to Iraq the second time. And I mean, of course, this is all speculation, but you know, there, uh, there, there seems to be that prevailing mentality that you know, if we were going to, if we were going to do a regime change, that would have been the time to do it when we had the physical resources and we had the metaphysical assets to do so. And you know, if not pursue that option, then at least keep Saddam contained, keep him with his no-fly zones, keep the UN inspectors on a uh, on a cyclic basis in and out of Iraq to uh, make sure that he stays in that little jar and he stays on the shelf and doesn't threaten any one of his neighbors ever again. But again, all speculation. Yeah. Well, that, there's no shortage of it for Iraq. And I'll just say briefly that it frustrated me to see the second Gulf War that people were saying, well, the, the old man didn't finish the job, didn't finish the job, didn't finish the job. Well, right. the job was to eject Saddam's ass from Kuwait. That was it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the job. So strictly speaking, yeah. the man completed the job and the worries about the coalition splitting and about Arab allies, we look at Syria today, keep in mind, we had Syria was part of that coalition, right? right. So th there are many unanswered questions, but that always bugged me because exactly what you're talking about and what we learn here in Skybreak about a narrowness of focus and leadership, which I'll get to in a second. But mm -hmm. to me, it was constantly this whipsaw effect. And the fact that these men were able to do their jobs despite that, despite this constant, well, do this. Well, that works, then do that. Well, that th yeah, do this. Then they try this and that fails. That That's so much been the case here in the Iraq war. And they really nag and everybody pokes and prods the 
the the second President Bush into into that war. We've got to finish it. We've got to get rid of him. Why didn't we do it? Congress passes resolutions, right? That right. our policy is to get rid of Saddam and all these things. And then they do it and they act as if everyone acts as if again the failure has no has no father. So I find that fascinating here that as you're talking about in, in Skybreak, that they were able to focus, do their job that was limited in scope. So to me, they have they have their own legacy that nobody can touch. So it's probably unfair to try to ask them to look at the larger policy that that unfolded later because they have a legacy. It's here in Skybreak. You can get their stories. I wanted to bring up your bio of Hal Moore. It's called Hal Moore, a soldier once and always. What universal lessons of good commanders did you find yourself recognizing in the men you interviewed for Skybreak since Hal Moore's legacy and your book on Hal Moore is so much of who you are saying, yeah, I see this is why they succeeded there in a way that other commanders might have failed. Take care of your people and they will take care of you. That was the prevailing theme that I got throughout the entire book. And uh, that really dovetailed into the general overall leadership philosophies that Hal Moore had, you know, because what I saw play out really just time and time again throughout Skybreak was that there was an incredible synergy between the officers and the enlisted personnel. And it was incredible because you see the same dynamic as you do in the army, but it's framed a li- little bit differently. See, in the army, the, uh, the, the, prevailing, uh, the prevailing organizational dynamic is that the enlisted soldiers are the ones who do most of the fighting, while the officers are, are generally seen as the managers, they're seen as, they're seen as the team leaders. And that doesn't mean that the officers don't fight, they do, but it just means that they take more of a supervisory role. But when you take an aviation unit in the Air Force, those roles, for the most part, are reversed. It's the officers who are doing most of the fighting, and it's the enlisted personnel that are doing, that are doing most of the maintenance work, they're doing most of the managerial aspects to keep those fighter assets workable, and all, and also to keep them all, and uh, and all, also to keep them serviceable. So you see, so you see two different dynamics there, but the but the relationship and that synergy is exactly the same, because the pilots knew that they did not own those planes. It, it, it was common knowledge that the planes. All belong to the maintenance crews, and the maintenance crews are the ones who own everything about those planes. And they and the pilots were telling themselves, "Okay, I need to have a good working relationship with my crew chief. I need to have a good working relationship with everybody who is on his crew because they are responsible for a critical component of this plane that's going to keep it in flight and it's going to help me accomplish my mission." So the mentality there is how do I develop a good relationship with my crew chief and how do I maintain that good relationship, take care of him and make sure that he has everything he needs to keep my plane serviceable. And how do I maintain that good relationship so that not only will he be able to fulfill his job in keeping the plane in good working order, but I can fulfill my job to do my duty as a pilot and come back and be able to fly another day. So if you take care of your people, they will take care of you. And it, it's, it's amazing how much they help each other out because you know, you'll know you have situations where a pilot is in, in dire need of a plane, but his plane's not ready yet. But if he has a good working relationship with the maintenance crews, they'll cross talk and say, hey, this guy here is a good egg. He needs a plane. He needs one on a, on a quick turnaround. Hey, we just got this plane over here serviceable. You can jump in that one. And I can vouch for that crew chief because He's been with me for X amount of years, and I've told him that you're a good pilot who cares about his crew. I'm so glad you brought that up because nobody fights in a war alone. And certainly the crew, I mentioned U.S. Grant, and he was a quartermaster. It's one of the reasons why he was a great general. He knew to keep his people supplied and do that job. So was William McKinley, who I mentioned, who's there at Antietam, Mm -hmm. the bloodiest day in, in U.S. history at that battle, risking his life to supply men that are cut off and bring them messages to pull back, that kind of thing. I was on an amateur racing pit crew for a while too. So it's not, I think of those guys like that, right? They're not the ones who are, they're not the ones who get the laurels, right? Pick up Skybreak, you get some of that story as well and enjoy it. I wanted to ask you a final question and it goes to that idea of legacy, Mike. It's something I heard an RAF pilot say once. He was talking about 
how you go to Gettysburg or you go to the beaches of Normandy and you could see physical places and you can say this is this is the steep cliffs at Pont du Ho and, and you can think about that battle and put yourself in those boots. But the Battle of Britain is harder to connect with because when you want to see the battlefield, it's all right up there over your head. So right. it's everywhere. It, you can't mark it with a plaque. You can't go and mm -hmm. walk the land in a way you can those great war battlefields and still see pock marks in the ground, still go through the Maginot Line from the Second World War and things like that. So how do you hope readers of Skybreak will remember the legacy of the 58th Squadron, the men in the air and the men on the ground there? They're keeping the planes right. flying and keeping this war, this mission on track this whole time from Desert Shield to what your book covers, Desert Storm, when they're liberating Kuwait. How do you hope the next time somebody looks up at the clouds, maybe while they're reading Skybreak, they, they look up there and think about what it was like. How do you hope that they'll remember the legacy of the guerrillas, the 58th? Well, if anything, Dean, I really would like them to try to connect with the fact that air campaigns serve a very critical purpose in the outcome of any conflict. You know, you, you, you can never win a war through air power alone. And, you know, and it, it really is a concerted effort of both air and ground operations uh, working together to, to achieve any number of critical victories. So what I really want readers to do is, you know, is whenever they read Skybreak or if they read books on uh, any other air campaign for that matter, is just to know that uh, even though it's harder to mark a particular point in space where any particular air war happened that they all served a critical function and that uh, and that in a way I think it makes it a little bit more intimate for the reader because it's not something that you can mark on a particular point in the ground you have only you have only the pilot recollections to rely on and you only have their stories to help construct the narrative for you so I think that in and of itself adds a very great metaphysical dimension to it and also makes it a little bit more of an intimate experience for the reader. He says, okay, I'm relying only on the recollections of these pilots who were in this flight formation up there in the third dimension, and I have to reconstruct it in my mind and put all these pieces of the narrative together as opposed to, you know, trying to look at a particular point of geography and say, okay, well, yeah, I can imagine where this formation was versus that. Well, Everybody, please do pick up Skybreak. It definitely is an intimate connection with those pilots who fought, maybe in your lifetime, maybe not, but when they're up there in, in the wild blue yonder, you have to be able to connect with that. You have to get excited, feel your, your pulse pound. Thank you, Mike Guardia, author of Skybreak, the 58th Fighter Squadron in Desert Storm. I hope you'll come back and talk about maybe your Hal Moore book or one of your other great books of military history. I certainly enjoyed our conversation today about liberating Kuwait, about the people who answered that United Nations call, but also mostly fighting for the United States, applying all that training and experience. You called it a watershed moment. I think this is a watershed book, Skybreak. Please do pick it up, everybody out there. And I wish you, Mike Guardia, the best of luck with Skybreak. Thanks so much for your time today. Well, Dean, thank you so much for having me on the show. It was my pleasure to be here. Again, the book is Skybreak the 58th Fighter Squadron in Desert Storm. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyalter.com page for this episode. By buying the book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. Now that time machine can't go Mach 1 even. It's pretty slow, really, in physical terms. But I do so appreciate being able to bring you great authors and stories of great people such as the ones today from Mike Guardia. I want to thank him for strapping us all into the jump seat and giving us a view of the Gulf War in a way that is so easy to overlook because those pilots were so successful. Please do go find him at MikeGuardia.com or on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. If you enjoyed watching this episode, please do subscribe to me at our Twitter and Rumble channels. You can find me at HistoryAuthor.com all of my social media accounts are there as well. Plus, check out those pieces in the Washington Times. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. Coming back down to earth now, I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. 
until that next flight into the past together. On behalf of Mike Guardia and the men of the 58th, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.